Hello, good morning and welcome to day three of Confetti's Industry Week 2022. This is the Do It For Real Games panel and I am Alison Whitlock. Welcome, welcome this morning. And um, before we um, kick off the day's proceedings, I've just got a couple of messages to read to you. Um, don't forget you can still book onto upcoming events by going to iw.confetti.ac.uk. Make sure you sign up using your Confetti or your NTU email address. You can also check out previous year's talks and masterclasses on the on-demand section of the website. As part of Industry Week, you're probably aware by now, but we're running a photo competition with some really cool prizes. I think it's Amazon vouchers. All you have to do is tag Confetti on Twitter or Instagram with the hashtag IW2022, sharing your experiences throughout the week. Finally, if you are currently in your final year of an undergraduate course, it's worth noting that the NTU employability team are offering extra careers coaching sessions next week to help you get ready for your next steps after graduating. Look on the employability learning room for more details and how to sign up. Okay, so now on to the business end of today's session. This is a Do It For Real panel, and these sessions are all about celebrating our graduates' career success in the industry that they have chosen to study. So in this case, it's games. Um, rather than me do an introduction, I am going to ask our two graduates today to introduce themselves because they'll do it far better than I. Um, so I'm going to come to you both this morning. Um, if um, you'd like to introduce yourselves, tell us who you are, what you studied and when, and more importantly, what you're doing now. So Akib first. Hi there, guys. Uh, my name is Akib Khalifa. Um, I studied at Convey doing games productions. I think the year was 2017 I started. Not too sure of my dates. But yeah, I started as a FDSC course, and then I moved on to the the, the, the bachelor, bachelor's games production. Um, currently, I am working as a QA tester at Dambuster Studios in Nottingham. But yeah, that, that's me. Thanks. Welcome, Akib. And to Callum, who's, I think, a little bit of an industry week old timer. Sorry, Callum. <laughs> no, that's OK. I just feel a little bit odd. Yeah, I um, I left Confetti back in uh, 2018. Uh, first, I did the college course. I was there for two years. Uh, I, I'm not sure what year that would have been starting. But um, then I was at the, uh, you know, foundation science course for two years. Uh, left in 2018. Uh, first worked at Cloud Imperium Games as a junior designer. Uh, it's been about getting on for four years now and I'm sort of like a senior designer sort of like slash advanced designer like um sort of a halfway position between sort of being mid-level and a little bit higher but yeah that, that's me. Welcome Callum where are you talking to us from this morning? Uh, what this, part of the country? <laughs> this, this morning I'm in Guildford right now. We're in Guildford okay mm -hmm. well welcome um just a quick word to students out there if you want to ask our graduates any questions this morning please use the chat function in Zoom. What we're going to do is we're going to talk to our graduates a little bit first find out more about them find out about their world of work what they do to get work etc and then a little bit later on in the session we will take some students Q&A so um we've got um the lovely Dan Dowd who's sitting just um, beyond the camera who you can't see at the moment but has waved um, who's going to be moderating chat this morning and will be sending me questions on my phone so get sending in those questions right so I want to kick off proceedings um, guys just talking a little bit about your time at confetti and asking you what made you apply for confetti in the first place as a question to you Akib um so I think when I was at college and I was playing for university, I was looking, I was like really big into my games development and stuff. And I was looking at different universities. And for some reason, when I looked at like Confetti, they had like literally everything I wanted to do. Because I was at, I think I was at a point where like, um, I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do. Like, did I want to do programming? Did I want to do animation? And then like Confetti, the Confetti course literally had everything we wanted to do. So that's why I applied for Confetti and that's why I ended up at Confetti. Cool. Right. Yeah. What about you, Callum? Cool. Um, a lot of the same reasons. Uh, obviously, just re rewinding a few more years. Uh, I was sort of finishing up school. Uh, me and all my friends are obviously like, you know, peaks and whatever. And we all love games. And I was like, uh, from a young age, I always knew I wanted to sort of make things. I, I wasn't sure what, you know, like same sort of idea. Did I want to be a designer? Did I want to be a programmer? I, I really wasn't sure what. Um, someone told me about Confetti. I think their brother was doing um, like music production at the time or something. Uh, obviously, I think the biggest thing for me uh, was sort of that it was local like um obviously I, I was always in Nottingham uh, it was just so great to sort of be somewhere 
I don't know, a little bit close to home. Uh, yeah, that's why I chose it. I just sort of wanted to, because it sort of offered a little bit of everything. Uh, I think it was just really good for me to figure out what I wanted to do in games. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, how did Confetti support your career decisions during your studies and directly afterwards? Callum, what about you? Cool. Uh, so, like I say, when, when I first got there, uh, I really wasn't, I knew I wanted to make games, but I really wasn't sure exactly like what I wanted to make in games. And sort of like, obviously it's, it's a few years ago now, right? Like six or seven or eight years. Uh, but I remember at college, it sort of started out as like um, you know, a little bit of it was a little bit of music, a little bit of engine work, a little bit of art, a little bit of 3D modeling. Like it was it was everything. Uh, and sort of like that was on like a, a weekly curriculum sort of basis. And um, sort of doing a little bit of each, like I sort of realized over time, like I realized like, oh, OK, I'm gravitating more towards the engine side of stuff. I'm sort of gravita gravitating towards sort of like the programming side of stuff. Um, but I, I think it was really good as well that I got the chance to do, do that other stuff. So I think. I think just the opportunity to sort of try a little bit of everything was was great for me. Like, uh, and also as well with the assignments that I ended up getting. Again, this was a long time ago now. I'm not remembering all the details, but, but again, because they sort of like because so much of the marks sort of ended up being around like all facets of games. Uh, it just sort of gave me the time to sort of play with just all of it and sort of get really really good sort of hands on experience, even like away from the lessons, just to sort of like play with what I wanted to play with in games. Yeah. Great answer. So it allowed you to dip your toe in the water and, and uh, experiment in lots of areas yeah, but, but, to but enable just that, you to not, find the focus. Yeah, yeah, not just that, though. Like it was like dipping my toes in the water. But then if I did sort of want to do more in a specific area, I, I sort of could sort of really go a little bit further in those areas. Like if it was really engines, really sort of focus on that. Yeah. What about you, Akeeb? Um, it's pretty much like Callum. I um, think when I started, like, like I said, is what, like I said before, like I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be like part of the games development, but I think the way the, conf the whole convey course was structured, I was, I was exposed to a lot of different like areas of games as well. I think at that time, I realized what I liked and what I didn't like. Mm. Like I, like, I hated 3D modeling. I know I didn't want to get into that. Right, but then I enjoyed like level designing and animation, like as well, stuff like that. So it's pretty much like Callum, you get to experience like different things as well. And I think at some point, the way the course was structured, the work that you do, you just kind of understand what you enjoy doing more. Mm. But, yeah. Um, sorry, Callum, did you want to say something? No, sorry, I was coughing. My bad. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, no, this is an interesting question. What was your best memory of confetti, Callum? I, for me personally. I really just liked the time I got to spend, like, I'd say on the assignments, but that's sort of like, not a lie exactly, but just the way that, the way that the marks ended up getting done during college and university ended up meaning that I could just spend lots and lots of time on my own, sort of working on whatever I wanted to work on. Mm -hmm. And then how it ended up working was like, I I'd just make whatever I felt like making, and then I'd sort of split it up, right? Like, I'd say like, okay, well, I made this little project and like, Okay, here's my 3D models from the 3D model project. No, you know, from the bigger project and then submit that for the 3D assignment, submit that for the animation assignment and whatnot. Um, so that was amazing. Just just sort of getting getting the time away from work and like responsibilities and having to pay bills and stuff like that. Um, just to be able to sort of focus on making games for a little bit and not worry about like, does this have to make a profit? Do I have to speak to you? Whoever. Uh, that was that was really valuable for me. Oh, you mentioned that. So were you working before you came to Confetti? No, no, but it was on my mind. Like I was really oh, right, okay. about it. I, I, yeah. I was sort of really cognizant about like, oh God, once I leave school, like I've got to, you know, you're out in the big wide world. You yeah. Know, uh, it gets pretty real after that. And uh, you've got a lot less time to sort of really focus on your passions and sort of focus on your art and yeah. stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Very wise words, Callum. Yes, <laughs> it gets serious when you leave. Um, Akib, what about you? What's your um, best memory? I actually got two memories that I quite remember fondly. Um, so I think when we, I think in the third year when I got introduced to the, mo um, the motion capture suite, and then I had like uh, Michael let's talk out the whole process around it. Mm. I, I just I was just so like gobsmacked like the the map and just possibilities I could do with it. I just loved the whole like concept like people getting to the mocap suit. And doing the thing and then like it's really amazing like, so the certain things that you can create with it as well mm. i think a second thing was i think during my 3d modeling classes i just loved watching jin do his thing i think but <laughs> at that at that time i think jin was the course leader but then he used to teach his 3d modeling and every time he used to do his thing it was so mesmerizing it was like 
It was, it was amazing. It was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just um, describe what Jin Jin doing his thing looked like for you? <laughs> Me, he used to like he used to rumble on and he used to like sing as well sometimes with it. It was just having He'd a really good thing. Yeah, now and then. Yeah, yeah. So it's was, it was really good. Yeah. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, what do you think the most valuable thing was that you learned at Confetti, Akib? Most valuable thing. Uh, you know what? I, I think I learned that confetti when I go into view. There's it's no harm of asking questions, no matter how trivial it is. I think I think I, if I remember like I asked a lot of different same questions as well, but the tutor was more than happy to like mm-hmm. answer as well, no matter how menial the question was. Mm-hmm. I feel like I sh- I, I didn't leave anything that I didn't want to say. Like I just took I, I just asked them questions and I think, I think that's one thing I really lo- like learned that no matter how many the question is, you just ask it because who knows, like but yeah. Yeah, and he, and you, it gave you the confidence to ask. Yeah. Them. Did you take that with you out, yeah, out sure. into the world of work? Yeah, for sure. Like I think during my workplace as well. Like even I was new to the whole like QA t- um QA testing. Like mm-hmm. I was asking a lot of questions to them as well. Like I wasn't scared to like not ask them or anything. Like just because it was an industry level job and everyone should be like on their own type of thing. But yeah, that's one thing that convey convey that taught me was just you can ask all the questions you want. That's brilliant. And what yeah. about you, Callum? What's the, the most valuable thing you learned at Confetti, do you think? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to say the exact same as a keyboard. I will change it, <laughs> but I do think that's a really valuable point. And I really agree with it. Like, I think it there's a lot to learn about humility and just being like, having, just, just being able to say, say hey, I, I don't know this and I'm just going to ask someone else. And like, as you grow up and you sort of turn into a bit more of an adult, you sort of realise like a lot of people don't know a lot of stuff and it is not a problem to just sort of say, hey, I don't know about this. You know about this. Can you tell me about this? And no one's going to laugh at you. No one thinks it's mm-hmm. hilarious. And even when you start getting even, I learned that at Confetti, but then even getting more experience, probably like the keep as well, like being in the industry and sort of turning around to people and you, you sit there and you think, oh my God, you must know everything. Like you've been working in games for God knows how many years, but they still don't know some things and they're still not embarrassed to answer your questions. You're not expected to know everything. No one's expected to know everything. Mm, so I'd agree with that. Absolutely. Uh, but uh, yeah, I suppose as well, uh, sort of trying to come up with different for from Akib, I think it's really important sort of managing my time a little bit, um, sort of being able to sort of, like I mentioned before, it gets really quite real after you leave university and college and everything and sort of taking that time to be like, okay, I've got these number of days, I really want to make this, like, I don't know, I want to make this uh, like a, a piece of art or, or a game or something and yeah. being able to structure it in my head and say like, this is going to take X number of hours and I need to put this amount of time in and being being realistic how long it takes to to achieve goals and like being like oh I, I can't I can't slack off this evening because this has got to be done for this goal that I've got to do like being able to really respect like how much time it takes to sort of complete things especially obviously with art and games and everything like it you know being able to manage my own time both with both games and personal project stuff but then also like obviously life management is really good as well. Well, yeah, it's having a realistic sense of time frames for everything. Adulting. <laughs> Adulting. Um, I, I wasn't going to come to questions, but I am going to come to um, this question because it kind of like segues beautifully into the next section of, of questions, which is all about what happened when you graduated and that <laughs> scary moment when you finally leave the confetti nest, as it were. Um, uh, how long did it take you to find a job after uni? That's to Callum. Uh, for, for me, I left university straight into uh, getting a job. Um, for a long time, I'd sort of like, I don't know, it was really sort of ch- chance that I ended up getting it. Like, uh, you know, I wasn't expecting to sort of leave with a job. But um, obviously, I was, I was speaking to some of my friends. I was always speaking to Kyle uh, about sort of like, you know, people we both knew in games. Uh, we ended up, I, I sort of ended up getting introduced to some sort of like mutual friends and stuff. Uh, they passed my work along before I knew it. I sort of had interviews before I left. Uh, and so I, I did end up basically, it was the time between the second year and the third year of university. And I ended up sort of dropping the course because well, I got the job in hand. But um, yeah, I, I went I went straight into it. Um, sorry, I think there was a bit more to that question. I can't remember if I'm missing um, oh, it. How, lo- how long did it take you to find a job after uni? So you basically, you said you, 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 you finished your FDSC, your second year FDSC? Yeah, that's right. But I mean, speaking about how long it took exactly, like I, I kind of got the from start to finish and even sort of like you know speaking to other people and sort of seeing what their experiences have been I started sort of started like starting this process around about sort of January February 
I ended up meeting these contacts around about industry week 2018. Yeah. So that was like two or three months. And then it, it wasn't for another, I didn't start working until July. Right. So that was easily, God, I don't know, five or six months. Yeah, six months between mm -hmm. when you actually started to seriously consider it to when, mm -hmm. yeah, six or seven months. Yeah, exactly. Like, um, yeah. obviously, it was really like a, a smooth transition year. There, there weren't many sort of like snap fingers moments, but it, yeah, it, it's definitely like a long process. Like even, I suppose, speaking to students who sort of like leave university and say like, oh, I'm going to start looking for a job now. Uh, even if you do really, really well with that. Uh, it can take a long, long time to actually like between like I know this person, speak to this person, interview, et cetera, and sitting down and actually getting paid. It can take a long time. You've touched upon something that crops up in all of these panels across all of uh, the curriculum areas. And I think it is universal. It's speaking to people. And I want mm -hmm. to talk a little bit more about that because it did come up in the media panel. Speaking to people and networking, the N word, <laughs> Ooh, the yeah. scary N word. It's like, so where can you just talk us through your speaking to people process? Was that in a, in a networking event because there are networking events or was it in a less formal sort of like forced forced so, situation than a networking event for me personally obviously Akib, you can touch on it as well afterwards if you'd like um for me personally um it was I, I was friends with one of my tutors Carl Cherry I assume he still works he still works confetti but I think he's on the live events now right not games I'm not sure exactly what he's what is the role is now but he used to be in games he was one of my tutors we, we got on really well uh, he had a friend who also worked in games, uh, Steve Austin. I think he's also doing a talk this year, if I'm if I'm right. Uh, he worked at Cloud Imperium. Uh, those two were just friends. Me and Kyle were friends. It was like, hey, we're friends. We're friends. Do you want to speak to one of my friends? Like, we got to know each other a little bit. I obviously showed him my work. Uh, I, I really sort of think I don't I don't think it's gross, but I don't like networking. Like, I don't. It, it feels really like a makes me feel quite anxious the idea of speaking about it as, as sort of like a businessy term do you know what yeah. I mean like yeah it sort of makes it more than it actually is uh, yeah to, absolutely I think mm. you, that's a really crucial thing that I don't think anyone goes oh goody let's all go to it let's have a lovely networking yeah yeah session um it is it's chatting to people informally um and it, it depends on the you know the environment sometimes it is a a, a more formal networking event that mm -hmm. follows on from say a guest speaker thing that you might go to whatever but networking's chatting to people isn't it actually yeah. and then that, chatting to people isn't scary as as such is it mm -hmm. no not, not not whatsoever like um i think it really helps as well like um it, it was quite good the games industry in nottingham was okay when i was at university but i think it's got even better like uh, obviously dan busters has come a long way uh, sumo digital moved there i can't remember when it was like 2017 or something yeah and there's like one or two other studios and like it ends up being like for example i i, I don't know you end up knowing friends of friends like for example yeah. i don't think i don't know about akib like uh I, I have a friend who works at dan busters i don't know akib but like we probably have a friend of a friend and that could be like yeah. a jumping point like the longer you i know this is more of a case of like the longer you spend in games but like you the world ends up being quite small yeah. And you, you know, you always end up knowing someone who knows someone. And yeah. it's more about being friendly than sort of like greasing hands and, you know, shaking hands and all that. Like, it's, yeah, it's yeah. more just a friendly environment thing. Yeah. Again, Akib, I don't know if you want to sort of add anything there. Okay. Akib? Yeah, sorry, I'm almost muted. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, I think everything Callum said was right. But obviously, I think in my case, um, I didn't like, I didn't like leave uni or anything. I went through the whole three years, right? Yeah. And like obviously after like a few months, I did the traditional thing. Like I was just applying to places and stuff like that after graduation. And then look, um, fortunately then um, Dambus has got back. And then that's how I managed to land my role into the industry after a few months graduating. But yeah, um, I didn't do much. I think I did networking once I got the job. Like I was talking to different developers and stuff like that. But that was my way. But I was already in the industry as well. Yeah. Opposed to like Calm, how you was always already talking to people as well. And that's how like the job progressed but yeah I think with me it was like I went through the whole like I was applying for different places after graduation and stuff like that obviously rejections and then you get some some places that oh, you don't have an experience and stuff like that but eventually um I think Dan has got back and they said yeah um, we'll take you on and everything like that was that okay let's start. I just want to talk about that a little bit more how many jobs did you apply for and how many rejections did you get what did that feel like 
I can't remember at the top of my head how many um rejections were there. I think there were there were de- definitely rejections. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you want to I, talk about that, or would you prefer <laughs> to like forget about I, I it? I think it's fine to talk about it because I got the job in the end anyway, so it's not too bad. Um, yeah, I think Rockstar was probably the hardest one to deal with. It was half a hard pill to swallow, just because I'm really into the games and everything. So like working with them would have been really awesome to work with them as well. Yeah. But obviously, like they said no as well. So I think I think maybe it was due to experience or something. Uh, that that was the reason why, and then like yeah, I was I remember I was a bit gutted through like, a couple of days as well because I was really like hyped up, and then yeah yeah yeah, and I think I I, I, I know like a lot of people apply for Rockstar as well, and I had the first interview which was uh, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, I, I managed to progress to like, the second interview, and then obviously they said no then, and I, I was like I was really gutted for that like, couple of days as well just because like yeah. I got to that far and just couldn't make it. But it's one of those things where, like, the game industry is like, you're, you're going to get rejections. Like, that, that's what it is, right? But then you can't let, get, let that get down to you because you just you keep, like, keep applying. So I've got two questions. Can you describe the difference? But, so you actually applied to Rockstar with, for an actual role. What was the role? Was it QA? Yeah, it was QA, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you applied for that, and there was a first stage interview and a second stage interview. Can you describe the, what those, that first stage and second stage interview was like? Yeah, so um, the second stage was like talking to the, um, it was actually talking to the developers as well, like the, the hiring managers and stuff like that. And the first stage was just like a, in, uh, just an interview, like a one-sided interview, like just getting to know you, uh, like asking different questions and stuff like that. Yeah. So what was the difference, do you think, for uh, in the second uh, second interview? Was it a panel of people that were asking you questions? Yeah. So normally, like interview, you'll, you'll assume like there's like one other person and yeah. there's you. But this time it was actually three of them, right? Which is was quite um intimidating as well, to be fair. So I think I think I was nervous on that interview as well, just because how popular the job role was yeah. and everything other. Like and what was was it online or was it in person, Akib? No, it was online. How was did that really... feel? How talk me through that? Just what was that like? It was alright. I'm, I'm I'm used to having like online interviews and stuff like that. Um, I'm not. Um, yeah, it was alright. It was the nerves was alright because I was in my comfort in my own home as well, so it wasn't that bad. But I think the nerves nub, the nubs did, did really kick in because I know like what company I was applying for and stuff like that. And you'd 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 put you'd you'd really set your sights on Rockstar. Yeah, I did. Yeah, just because I'm I'm really big in the games as well. So when I saw them, yeah. them not hiring, I was like, you know, I'm re- I really want to do it. So I kind of set that expectations as well, as sure. well, which is another thing as well. I think depending on what sort of games you play and you apply for the studios, right? I think you have that sort of expectation that if you don't get it, that it's gonna really like bum you up. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, what well, can you just talk? Did you dress? Seeing as you did an online interview um, for both the first and second stage, I'm assuming. Um, did you dress in an interview styley? Did you dress so, formally? What, what? How did that work? <laughs> so I was. I, I wore like a shirt, but I was still in my pajama trousers as well. No. <laughs> 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 I mean, if they don't, if they don't just see the whole body, I was like, I would have I would have seen something more comfortable. So I thought I, I was like, top of the top half, I was proper smart as well and then like I had a haircut <laughs> and everything and then second no, it was just pajama trousers pajama f- trousers and some flip-flops yeah some fluffy <laughs> slippers that's so yeah. funny <laughs> oh god it's funny um how did you deal with the rejection then because this is obviously you know everyone gets gets rejected from job interviews throughout life but it's not just yeah. a, a graduate thing how did you remain resilient psychologically resilient how did you pick yourself up because the rock star was your dream job at the time yeah you'd set all your sights on it what were your coping mechanisms you know i i, I took um i stopped applying for a bit and it's, I, I thought you know what i'm not gonna apply for a bit i'm just gonna like, take it easy for a bit but then like, i thought why am i applying for the first place like why did i study at confetti like why did i even go to confetti as well for example and i think it all like ruled down to just because i'm i'm really passionate about the old game industry and stuff like that and like I knew that I, I do I really want to work in the game industry if it's like if it's QA or wherever the role is. I think and then I think I just took some I took I took some time back and then I just reevaluated my why did I do everything in the first place? And then I think I just got back afterwards. So you kind of stepped back from it and saw yeah. the bigger picture yeah. and asked yourself some bigger questions and like, hang on a minute, there are other there's loads of other games companies out there and they're not sure. a million miles away from where you are. And you know. That rock stars maybe for the future, maybe it's for another time. You yeah. know, I, there's a lot of sidestepping around. Callum's t- touched upon something really um, interesting about creative industries in any sector. Really, they're small industries. Everyone ends up knowing each other. They're like yeah. kind of like games families. 
that move between different companies in different parts of the country or different parts of Europe or America, whatever it might be. I just want to come back to Callum now. Have you had a lot of job rejections? Um, not a lot. Uh, when, I, <laughs> when I was at university, like um, I, I was also planning on doing around about the same thing where, um, you know, sort of I was going to come to the end of the year and then start applying. Uh, but sort of things started unfolding, obviously speaking to Steve and sort of working things out with Cloud Imperium. That ended up sort of unfolding. Yeah, the writing was a little bit on the wall for me. And I sort of thought that was going to work out. Uh, but, but I still did apply for a few. And um, yeah, I, I've got to agree, like it's really disheartening. Like it's really bad. Um, I, I sort of applied for, I don't know, half a dozen sort of studios or something. Uh, like one or two of them, I screwed them up. Like, you know, I, I sort of copy pasted the wrong names into the cover letter or something stupid. Uh, but I got rejected by all of them. And they all it's really difficult it's you I think one thing that I that helped me was sort of not not to sound arrogant but some people don't they don't realize just from your application maybe how good you might be I really don't think it sort of gets across enough of how valuable you might be to a team or whatever like uh, for example the people that I knew and I was speaking to on a personal level um they were quite excited about what I was doing I think you know that made that made me feel good and uh validated what I was doing in games but uh, I think just focusing on the rejections, it was really disheartening. Like, uh, it's almost like they don't even realize, you know, who you are. And obviously for me, it was okay because I had like, well, these people are saying this, but they're just, I didn't say this, but you're like, oh, they're, they're just missing out if they don't hire me or whatever. Like, you're just sort of thinking they don't, it was okay for me. But if I had just got those rejection letters, uh, I think it would have really put a totally, me in a totally different headspace. Like those, those rejections are really, really tough because even though I can respect now that they don't, they don't get in the fuller picture. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's tough. I don't know. I don't know what I would have done. It's, it's hard when it's, it starts happening to you and you're not, it's not a familiar feeling, I think, mm -hmm. but actually, I, I, you know, at some point or another, we're all going to be rejected. About yep. something. We need to find ways of getting over it, at, at getting over that bump in the road. And it is only a bump in the road. We've got some really great questions coming in. So thank you um, for so many great questions. And, you know, what? I'm going to break my own rule and come to some of the questions because they're relevant to this part of the conversation that we're having at the moment. So please excuse me while I just unpick some of them. Should I start applying for jobs before I graduate? um go, uh, whoever wants to take that please yeah, i mean i mean i will i mean sort of uh yeah so sort of going off the back of what i say uh, i said sorry about my situation uh yeah definitely 100 percent. like um i'm not sure obviously everyone's home life's different um everyone's life situation is different obviously for me it was it would it might have been okay uh, if i had finished university and i didn't get a job uh i would have been okay living with my parents and sort of that would have sort of taken me on for a little bit longer mm. uh, but not everyone's got that sort of security net you know uh like i was mentioning uh, once you sort of leave university life gets pretty real uh, you know you need to start focusing on work you need to start focusing on paying the bills and everything and <laughs> life gets in the way um so yeah i mean obviously some of you if you know what your situation is if you know you're going to be okay sort of carrying on looking carrying on looking for the perfect place and all that you know i, I can't tell you what's perfect but definitely the sooner you can sort of bank somewhere while you're in this really safe mm. uh comfortable position I, I definitely I definitely start applying sooner than later e even if even if your work's not as perfect as it could be even sometimes as well if you talk like if you're talking to people on an individual level and you say here's where my work's at today mm -hmm. and then you can come back at the end of the year and say hey this was good and now a few months later I'm even better mm -hmm. that looks good as well mm -hmm. so like don't even feel anxious about not having all your work together or everything good point very good point Okay, what do you think about that? Do you think it's a good idea to start applying for jobs before you graduate? Oh yeah, for sure. I think there's not harm in, harm in like looking for places already because these interview process take months and like months yes. as well. You don't, you don't know like, yeah, I think you should definitely like apply like quite early on. But I think with me is that like, I think I put more more of my emphasis on like finishing the year off just uh -huh. because I had like some sort of like, I've had some like troubling um, times at Confetti as well just like mentally as well so I wanted to get that I want to get that year done and put on my uh, mind and effort into the whole like finishing my third year uh -huh. dissertation all my final year projects and stuff like that but then again like I'm not not saying that Callum's idea is wrong or anything like that but I think you should definitely apply for these different places because you never know because the worst thing they're gonna do is say is no but then that's fine because you start at uni but at least you can keep applying though 
and you can get used to that feeling of being rejected. So <laughs> I'm not trying to be put a downer on this, but you know, it is yeah. going to happen. It, it is going to happen. The yeah. sooner you accept it, um, the sooner you can become familiar with the feeling and know that it finishes and it, yeah. you move on. Um, this ties in with that whole thing around um, job applications. What do you recommend to include in your portfolio? What should you not include? Who would like to take that first? Um, I think that's more of a kind of question. Yeah. Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> sure, that's okay. Um, okay, so like in terms of things not to include, uh, there's not a, I mean, as long as it's relevant, I think that's okay. I'd say even if like, let's say you are a programmer, right? And you want to demonstrate your programming skills. I think it's okay, perfectly fine to sort of include your white box art or even whatever, like even if the art's not the focus, it's okay, like people, people aren't stupid, you know, like if you're a programmer and the, your, your demonstration is the technicals, people aren't going to focus on your less important skills if like what you're applying for is like a programmer role or something. So in terms of what you shouldn't include, like if, if you've got buckets and buckets of examples, but you've got like, you know, a, a nugget of brilliance in there, don't bury that under loads of, loads of rubbish, like make your best things the most important things include all your stuff but if it's if it's loads of little examples just make that less important or at least mm -hmm. they come to it later in your cv or whatever the heck you show enough uh and what was the other one what's good to include was the other yeah, part what you should what you should and shouldn't include in a portfolio yeah it should uh i suppose i'll just mention it again then like yeah. make sure if you if you're a programmer show sure your programming demonstrations make sure that's really obvious if you're an artist get your best sort of art piece or whatever you want to do and say hey this is what I do best. Here's the first thing. And it's like, bang, first thing you see. Uh, just make, yeah, m make sure your strengths are the, the bits that are showing off the best. And your weaknesses, again, if, if you're making a game and the gameplay wasn't very good, but that's okay because you're a 3D modeler, uh, people aren't going to care. Like if you're showing an example of where your work's been applied, people aren't going to care about the rest of the game. So much at least, I think. Um, they're going to focus on your strengths. So don't stress about the bits that you're not so good at your good work will shine through as long as you sort of like show that off is what think, i'd say i think you've um, made an interesting point because sometimes this comes up in a first or second interview um that around uh, uh, recruiters generally um often do competency-based interviews now so they have really open questions like could you um what do you consider to be your strengths and what do you consider to be your areas for improvement so having an innate sense of how you might answer that question to begin with is um quite useful because i don't think it's bad to recognize that you're, you're not brilliant at everything would you agree with that callum yeah 100 percent. i mean it's even like uh, i keep saying before like there's a certain strength as well in sort of being able to admit like, hey, I don't know everything yeah. and it's okay to sort of ask for help and whatnot. Like, yeah, a hundred percent. Like, I think you should just have like modesty um, and, and like the, the good bits will shine through and they'll yes. notice that. But then also yes. you should be like, you know, you should recognize the bits that maybe fall a little bit short and recognize where that's okay. Or, yeah. or at least if it's not, just, just be honest yeah. about it. Like say, hey, I, I don't work with people very well just be honest with that say like hey I'm, I'm a bit more of a i like to focus on myself and i could have some improvement there or you know just points points like that just be honest and say sure i could develop that more absolutely um okay but i've got a question specifically for you <laughs> what skills do you recommend developing to become a qa tester skills um i would so with qa tester it's quite a repetitive job so i think having um patience right and i think it's really key as well just because we've been doing you do the same thing every day and you're gonna have that mentality that mentality that you're right to doing that i think that's probably the biggest one i would say being patient as well um i guess i think there are different skills out there but i think everyone might have it as well i think the biggest one i would say is definitely patience as well just because when i started the job like we do the same thing like day on day out and then it's one of those things that you you have to be willing to be open to doing, doing that as well mm -hmm. but yeah Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just looking down these questions. This is an interesting one. Is university a necessary step to become a games designer? I can take that one. If yeah. Like. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's a necessary step, but like I was mentioning before, like not not to be too sort of like dark about it, but like, yeah, like life does sometimes get a little bit real. And for me, at least, it was a really nice opportunity to be like, um, you know. I don't have to worry about the bills. I don't have to worry about this, that, and the other. Like it was a really good period of my life to be able mm -hmm. to sort of like 
dedicate myself to to my art and my craft and all that stuff um and it was really really valuable for me uh i i benefited a lot from the lessons i benefited a lot from the people that i met i benefited a lot from all of it if you ask me could i have done it maybe without it maybe but i think i really benefited from just sort of having that opportunity to sort of say like like with it unequivocally i am dedicating myself to this um mm -hmm. so yeah maybe if you're here now i mean you might as well stick with it like <laughs> you know like if you're asking the question you're already here but yeah i i not on no but you know big asterisk great so yeah <laughs> um this is an interesting one as well um a few questions a few questions are coming in about apprenticeships and whether in your experience and this is probably for you callum um in your experience is the industry 18 plus you know what mm. from the people you've met so far that's a good question uh i couldn't tell you you know like um it maybe i can answer that with a slightly different sort of thing yeah. where like in my experience, uh, once you sort of get into games industry, uh, as, you, as you're a teenager and sort of like quite young, uh, you sort of very much focus on like, oh, I'm 17 and my friends are 18 or whatever. Mm. But uh, once you sort of get into games, it ends up being like, I'm 18, 19 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then past that, people can be up to like 40 or, you know, whatnot. And you're all sort of all, all of a sudden on this sort of same level and you don't really notice how old people are. Mm. If you're good enough for the job, if you're 18 years old or 19 years old and you're good enough for the job and you're an adult, yeah. Um, people aren't going to care like I was yeah. I was 19 or 20 or something when I first started and nobody noticed uh sure. you know no one obviously people noticed I was young but like I don't know in, in terms of like you don't have to be a certain age to be ready it's just to be good enough you're good enough hmm. um are you aware uh, in your professional experience to date of any apprentices that are working around you or in any of the companies you've worked for <sighs> It depends like a, when we say apprentice we, we mean like a like work placement right well yeah i mean like there are apprenticeships at like college level so level three 16 mm -hmm. to 18 year olds but also a degree there are degree level apprenticeships as well and i just i wondered if you'd come across any of those kinds of people or the, if you are if you have come into contact with students that are on like a sandwich placement that's more yes. common within yeah. games to be on a sandwich placement and then return for a fourth year back at uni but i'm yeah. talking about apprenticeships so like a, a um a work base a job that's got you know students or apprentices that are doing a job and being paid an apprenticeship wage but then they go and do it's like a day release or they do some other study off site mm -hmm. um obviously i don't know you know everything that goes on in the games industry mm. i don't think of that specifically where like yeah the job is the course i haven't come across that i know about two or three people who i work with who are um not on play interns that's it where like they're on like the third year of university or right. they were on their fourth or whatever um yeah. they ended up working there anyway like they sort of wrapped up the course they got their full degree and all that and then they ended up getting paid more and staying anyway mm. um there, there are quite a few people who do that so yeah on their on their like nearing the end of the course they'll come get placement for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of the whole course, uh, you know, the whole um, apprenticeship, like in, in the whole thing is working at the company. I personally haven't come across that. Uh, okay, that's great. I was just, it's quite mm. interesting. It's a good question. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Because I think degree level apprenticeships, uh, technical apprenticeships and digital apprenticeships are still quite a new thing. And I just wondered in your experience, um, if you come across that in any of the companies you work with, but uh, it's a really good question. So thank yeah, you definitely. for asking that, whichever student did. Um, there's, I, I, I've got a, a specific Callum question. I'm gonna come on to that in a minute, but this is a question for both of you really. So Akib, maybe you first, because Callum's been doing a lot <laughs> of the last sure. one. Um, how did studying at Confetti help either of you get a foot in the door in the companies you work for? Callum, you've kind of answered the question previously, but Akib, did, what, can you answer that at all? Yeah, sure. Um, to be fair, when I started Confetti, I was not a local to Nottingham, so I'm from Leicester. Yeah. Yeah. So I wasn't, I wasn't aware of any game studios in Nottingham. Right. So I think throughout, the, like, throughout my years at Confetti, I think we get told like different things, or there's these studios here you can check out so i think our tutors telling us what studios there are and like what sort of like studios there are and stuff like that that definitely did it um uh, definitely helped help me as well because i wasn't aware of any studios in um in nottingham to be fair i was uh -huh. like i was like damn there's all studios in nottingham there's like, quite a few but yeah i think that's one thing as well for sure 
And I know Confetti is quite popular with different students as well, because I know they do a lot of different, like, they kind of like work together as well. So it's kind of good to as well have that, oh, you're a Confetti student. So then they already kind of know yeah. what sort of like course you were doing and everything like that. So I think definitely the connections and like them, and the, I think the two are telling you what sort of studios are in, it can definitely help me. Because yeah, I wasn't aware of any studios to be fair. So, so yeah. They call it um, they call it an employability language. Yeah, yeah. Um, labor market intelligence. It's like you are studying a course. Are you aware of the work that is immediately available to you in the local yeah. area or the you know within you know a certain sort of like geograph a geographical range kind? So, so confetti helped you a lot with that. With yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, now, Callum, you did touch on this before because um, obviously you talked about the the connection with. Kyle Cherry on the course and everything. It it sounds. I don't want to preempt your answer, but did studying help you get your foot in the in the door? I think it did, didn't it? Really? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like, um, obviously that wasn't you know it's not something I intended to do, right? But like that's what ended up sort of happening organically, just because you know friends of friends and stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I I do think sort of confetti helps me with that. And if it if it wouldn't have ended up that way, I still think it would have something else would have sort of figured its way out. I guess. Um, yeah, I, I definitely agree. Brilliant. Callum, I'm going to ask you the question for you now. Uh, this may be quite a long answer. I'm not sure. Um, as a designer, could you talk us through your day to day? Do you work in an office or from home now? Has the pandemic changed things? Yeah, that's a really good question. It is. OK, so starting with the last bit, has the pandemic changed things? Day to day, the work I actually do. No, my, my work's exactly the same. Uh, nothing's changed. Um, obviously other than being in meetings rather than having to look at someone's face in person like that's obviously different but yeah the, the actual workload and workflow and all that is exactly the same um day to day, to day what i do um so i'll run you through just a normal day yeah uh, you know I, I sort of we have flexi hours at studio so we can start anywhere between about seven and ten uh then you sort of end up doing you know the full seven or eight hours or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh we have like a morning meeting where we used to stand up in person between like the design team. Uh, I'm a flight designer. So we say like, yesterday I dealt with this book. Today, I'm going to continue working on this book. I'm also going to speak to X, Y, Z people. And then you hear what everyone else says. Uh, you sit back down and then you do it. Um, you, I don't know, I might say, um, this objective isn't working. Why isn't it working? Uh, okay, investigate. Okay, this is broken, that's broken. I need to speak to the programmer. I need to speak to the artist. There's a, there's a prop in the way. I need to speak to the vehicles people because there's something specific wrong with the vehicle. Uh, maybe usually a meeting or two a day. Uh, sometimes we get uh, walked through things like a program. I'll say like, we're integrating a new way of setting up missions. Sit down for 30 minutes and I'll tell you how we're going to do it. Um, break at 12 to one. Uh, <laughs> obviously, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer in any more specifics. I just don't want to get too sort of nitty gritty. <laughs> um, usually meetings, if we're going to have any meetings, they finish up by about four. And then between, depending on what time you start, between the hours of four and obviously no, not many people leave at seven, but you know, at the very, if you start at 10, you leave at seven. If you started at six, you leave at four or whatever it is. Uh, yeah, sometimes I handshake with the people in Los Angeles at the end of the day, obviously it's just finishing up in the UK, they yeah. come online. So I'll say like, hey guy, you know, you're waking up to me today, here's your message. Yeah. And then they'll message me in the morning. Um, yeah, I can go into more specifics, but I don't want to bug it down with, you know, too, okay. Too many details there. All right. I, I'm going to ask Akib the same question, really, from a QA perspective, because QA is really it's quite a good, like, foot in the door kind of role, isn't it? Yeah. Akib? For sure. So, can you just talk us through your day to day, please? Yeah. So, like, um, um, we've got flexi hours, so we can like start any time between. I think it was, uh, <laughs> what was actually is I think eight between eight and nine thirty, I think, and then we get in, we do something called uh, morning smokes. So basically, we we run through the whatever the build of the game is, and basically we test the basic functionality of the game, make sure everything's working, nothing's broken overnight or anything like that. Um, and then we do something called regressions. So basically, the bugs that we've um, logged before, they might have come back, come back as clean fixed. So we gotta test that bug, make sure it's fixed. If it's not, then we send it back to the developers. So for example, in Callum's case, it could be a bug that he's fixing, yeah. And then I would I would test it, and then I was like, oh look, it's not fixed for this reason, and I send it back to Callum, and he'll look into it. And yeah. then wait, yes, sorry, just interject for two seconds. Like, yeah, when I mentioned before, like if I get told during the stand-up, like, oh, the objective markers 
not working. That's because Akib would have done it during the smoke test and he would have found out, oh, this objective isn't working. So he puts a JIRA in. I don't know if anyone knows what JIRA is, but it's basically like an online version of tracking what bugs we have. They send me a link. Uh, I assume you guys use JIRA as well, probably. Uh, but yeah, I'll get that JIRA and then I'll say, okay, that's finished. And I pass it back to Akib and then he'll go through the steps again. And if it works, close it off. If it doesn't, I have to work on it again. That's so, basically so, it. Yeah, that's a bit of the workflow. Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, no, it's all right. Um, and then um, and then after that morning test, we're done. And then we go into more like um, more specific testing, more like more intricate testing is more. So we look, we get, we look into our, a feature of the game and then we'll just break that down into more like different test cases and stuff like that. We'll test that. But that's usually what happens Monday to Friday as well. And anything anything that comes up during the day as well. So that's usually the case. Um, Akib, do you work in an office or are you entirely at home? Um, so, so starting from starting my job, I've been in the office from like since since I've since I've started the job, I've been in, going to the office. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I think what what happened then? I think when the pandemic started, a lot of people transitioned from work work from home. Mm -hmm. But obviously, they still had the option to um, if you want to work in the office, you can work in the office you want to do. So when they offered me that option, I was like, oh, for sure, because I I want to enjoy the commute. I don't want to stay in my house for like God knows how many like really long yeah. hours. So. Yeah, I think ever since I started, I've been going to the office. Because you're it's relatively like new to the industry still, Akib. Do you think that going in and working in office um, has benefited you? Yeah, I think so. Because um, I feel like n not everyone was there, but there were a few people there. And I got to talk to some of the developers as well. And nothing beats like face-to-face -face con um, contact when you're talking to them as well. So I think for sure, I think it's definitely benefited me for someone who's new to the industry. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, I, <laughs> um, we, I, I, everyone went into remote working initially in lockdown, but, um, you know, I think for anyone starting in a new company, the onboarding process in person is really, really um, important for yeah. new entrants into a company. For so sure. um, it's interesting that, that that was your perspective. And, yeah. Um, did you find that um, you got to know people and their personalities better from those like informal yeah um it was interesting conversations yeah so i got to talk to people that already they were still working in the, um, in the office and stuff like that and obviously I, I got to know um most of the qa team were working from home by that time so i was talking to them like online but it wasn't the same so mm -hmm. when they when they transitioned back to office it was it was a bit weird because yeah. like I'm not, I'm not i'm not used to seeing them like in person yeah i'm yeah. opposed to like other people that i've seen like like it's much it was much easier to talk to them yeah for sure so yeah. i think I yeah. Sorry, carry on. No, no, sorry, carry on. No, I was just going to say, I think, uh, you know, there's nothing like human interaction, is there? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and you do have far more informal chats and get to know people better yeah. in person, definitely. Um, really good answers. Thank you. Um, I just want to talk about just uh, the brilliant questions, and I'm going to try and gallop through as many of them as I can. We're still good for time at the moment. I just want to ask both of you um, where you find work. Are there particular platforms? Do you have LinkedIn profiles? Is LinkedIn um, the, your chosen place to snoop around and find work? Do you find it elsewhere? Just give us some hints and tips around where you find work now. That's a question to Callum first. Wait, sorry, do you, do you mind? Uh, I just had a little bit more to offer, I guess, with the sort of like oh. previous question a little bit. Yeah, please, mind. yeah, please carry on. Yeah, I, I suppose sort of like offering like a slightly different perspective. Uh, for yeah. me, uh, half of my career now has been sort of in the office, sort of like from the studio at the start. Yeah. And then the second half of my career now has been uh, so far working remote. So it's like two years one and two years the other. Yeah. Uh, I definitely agree that uh, during that sort of like initial onboarding process, uh, it was really beneficial to sort of like have the face to face interactions, you know, get a rapport with people and sort of really get like uh, involved with them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do definitely think, uh, at least in my experience, and I, I have found speaking to loads of different people in the games industry, it's um, definitely a personal preference thing yeah. but um, once you sort of get into the flow of things mm. uh, I've personally benefited from being out of the office uh, working remotely um, it, it's just re worked really quite well for me uh, in, in my experience uh, it's a little bit to do with I mean again it's entirely personal preference you know some people are just great socialites uh, I'm a little bit of an online sort of person mm -hmm. uh, all my interaction well not all my interactions I don't want to be that <laughs> sad but like a lot of my interactions have been like just sort of on Skype with my friends growing up, Discord when I was a bit older and stuff, yeah. like that was more me. And uh, yeah. I personally feel better speaking to the others. Like I, I felt I've been more productive. So some people, some people haven't. 
uh, that's sort of been a challenge. But that's a really good point. I think it's very much down to personal preference I, I, um, and well, how, how you are as a personality and, and recognizing your personality. Yeah. I, I, do, yeah, I, I agree. And I know that's what I said, but I do think the most important factor, actually, at least in my experience, yep. uh, is actually how the studio handles it. I think the way that the studio facilitates that kind of work has a big, big impact uh, oh, on yep. individual people. Uh, some companies, um, I think it's a really interesting turning point, honestly, in the games industry. Mm. Uh, I think it's going to offer a lot of big opportunities for some new students coming into it, a lot of opportunities for the future. If, for people that works for, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be great. Like. Um, when we think about the opportunities, like the studios just in Nottingham, there's like five or six. That's really, really good. Uh, but being able to sort of work for any studio in the UK remotely in the next yeah. four to five years, that's going to be incredible. Like for all of you people, yeah. uh, it's going to be awesome. Uh, obviously, there are some things that benefit from it, but um, they depend. Like I was saying, it's how the studio facilitates that stuff. For example, uh, they want me back in the studio at some point. Yeah, but that's probably going to be on a two to three day basis, uh, one to two day basis, sorry, a week. Uh, they might pay for my train tickets and stuff. Um, yeah, it's entirely how the studio benefit uh, facilitates staff, I think. But I, I, I definitely think there's a lot to dig into there uh, for students sort of going into the industry. It's going to be it's a really, really big change. And are you seeing like I'm reading a lot of industry reports across creative industries reports that it is um, there are skills shortages now. There are, are quite significant skills shortages mm -hmm. because um, what's happened, the pandemic has triggered what's called the great resignation. Mm -hmm. So there are people that are reevaluating re their lives and their careers as a result of COVID and the pandemic. Yeah, and their agree. reaction to that is to you know reevaluate and resign from their roles and mm -hmm. this is creating a massive opportunity for uh new entrants into the industry are you mm -hmm. seeing that callum yeah i'm 100 percent seeing that uh there's lots of people i work with in the industry uh cloud imperium games is not a remote working studio um uh, people who work remote uh it's for special situations like myself right. uh, but eventually they want everyone into the studio uh, a lot of the workers don't want to go back to the studio yeah that's a lot of the the feeling in the industry uh the reality is um it's the it's the employees who make the game uh, uh -huh. at the end of the day mm -hmm. and um you know if if people don't get what they want they'll take their talent elsewhere uh lots of people i know they've got to spend time with their children their pets their partners in my <laughs> circumstance yeah. uh, it's, been, it's been really quite well uh, when it works and i just think the reality is the genie's out of the bottle and if yeah. companies don't facilitate people, uh, they'll take their talent elsewhere. Really That's interesting, because that, that was actually one of the questions. Akib, I'm going to let you speak in a minute. But yeah, that, one of the questions was, it was about, it was further up the list. Now I can't find it. Um, are you happy in your current role or is there another job you want to work up to? <laughs> What's your dream job? <laughs> I think my, what my channel um, convey, I think it, it definitely opened up saying that I want to be in the, like, the animation side of the games, like working right. with mo motion capture and stuff like that. So I uh -huh. think that's probably the goal I'm, I'm aiming for. But to, to be, but that being said, I am happy at QA though, to be fair, because I, I play games, I enjoy playing games, and then that's what my job is, and then I don't mind. So I, I am happy with the job, but my goal is to work, to move, to transition to like a more of a motion capture operator role type of thing. It sounds like you walked into Confetti's mocap suite and it kind of like, it was a game changer. It, it triggered, that... yeah, 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 for sure. It, it triggered it. It was amazing. Like, I was so baffled when I walked into it. I was like, all these like endless opportunities and yeah, uh, yeah, it's amazing. It's a, a huge growth area, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, definitely. I just thought, back on the subject of um, you know, graduates entering the industry, are you seeing a lot of opportunities where you work um, at, for, for graduates coming through? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Yeah, I think as as like time goes, I think I think that it's more be more accessible for graduates and stuff like that. I do see a lot of graduates come through as well at Danbuses as well. So yeah. I think it's definitely it's definitely a thing. Yeah, and sure. there are lots of new opportunities and jobs coming up. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah. All right, I'm gonna just um try to make sure we cover as many of the student questions as possible. Um, what advice would you give to people who aren't confident in their artwork and are scared to apply to companies? You know what? I'm 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 a I'm a believer saying that even if you like a bit like I think you should still use um still use the artwork because it's a small portfolio for you to use as well. 
I feel like even if you don't think about it, I think you just add it on. Because like yeah, that's what I feel as well. Because like if you if you if you do this piece and stuff like that, I think you just include it. That that does that that's just my thing. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um what uh, Callum, have you got anything to add? Yeah, I, I think I'd agree. Uh sort of like circling back to the sort of statement I made before. Uh if your focus isn't art, people aren't gonna be bothered. Uh, if the art's a little bit poor and you're not an artist, uh, people are just going to ignore that. Like, they're not going to get hung up on that if you're a programmer or whatnot. Uh, but if you are an artist and you um, you really, really want to do this, I think it's important to just be honest about what your capabilities are. Um, if the work's two to three years old and it's not representative of what your talents are today, then leave it out because it is going to sort of maybe drag your stuff down. But if it's the work you're producing today and that's where your qualities are, uh, I, I think honest feedback is really important. Um, it's part of the humility, I guess, as well. Um, sort of what Akib was saying about being honest, about asking for help and feedback as well. I think that really ties into it. Uh, I think it's important to just get honest mm -hmm. feedback. Uh, most people aren't going to be nasty. They're not going to say, oh, this, this sucks. Um, they, they might give you feedback. And I think that's really important. Thank you. That's brilliant. Here's a good one. Um, this is from a female student, I would, I would suggest. Uh, for a woman, the games industry is quite scary. Is it completely male dominated? Would a woman have to work harder to be noticed? Given that it was International Women's Day yesterday, I think this is quite a timely question. What are your feelings on that, guys? Uh, I, I can start if you like. Yep, um, yeah, please do, Callum. At, at least in Cloud Imperium, uh, it is a very male dominated studio. Uh, right. It's not like a bro culture or anything like that, you know, it's not like, uh, oh, you know, we're all lads, we're talking about lads things. Uh, it's nothing in that respect, but there's very much a noticeable, huge, huge gap between the number of men and the number of women working in the studio. Um, for the women working there, uh, obviously, I can't, I obviously can't speak for what the, their personal experience has been like, but at least from the outside looking in, um, it seems like they haven't faced any not any adversity that's maybe a condescending way of putting it but you understand what I mean in that yeah you know they, they don't face like creepiness from the men or you know I mean anything just yeah. gross like, like obviously you hear these horror stories and at least in my experience at least again just in my limited view I've never seen anything like that um everyone's taken just as seriously it doesn't matter how like uh what you look like how old you are you know, what gender you are what it doesn't matter at least again in my experience everyone's opinion's valid it's not about who you are but I mean it doesn't matter who you are I guess like on a personal level but yeah like uh in terms of the job itself it's about your talents and yeah. at the end of the day that's sort of all that matters if that makes like in, in a comforting way uh -huh. uh, that's all that matters um I'd say don't let it put you off um if anything uh again in my experience it's not to do with in the in the day-to-day -day job how women are treated or anything like that that there's less of them I think it's just because they're not enough. I, I don't know. I don't know. But I think it's maybe because there's not enough women apply. Uh, we're more than happy to take on any of the talent, I think. It's just don't don't be put off. Don't be put off at all. Like, um, yeah, it's um, yeah, it's uh, do you think uh, <laughs> the games industry naturally still attracts a higher proportion of men to women, actually, because yeah. we see that on the courses as well. Mm -hmm. And just F FYI for information, um, I was really hoping to have a female games graduate on, on here today joining us just to prove that there are female games graduates at Confetti. And I, I went to at least eight games graduates, all of whom we got to a certain point and then they weren't able to join us, which is a real shame. And I know that someone quite close to you, Callum, Maggie yep. was, um, who did an industry week chat for us yesterday, um, mm -hmm. wasn't able to do it today, which is a real shame. It would have been lovely to have her here to answer that question as well. But um, yeah, um, rest assured, we, we really hope and we do everything to encourage um, more, more female talent to come through. And what, I, I, you know, Akib, in your experience at Dan Busters, what's the male to female ratio of staff, would you say? It's definitely like Callum. It's definitely more. There's more men and then more females in the studio. Um, um, but yeah, um, I get. We have like what one. We have one like woman in a, in our QA team as well. Right. But then again, like she doesn't need to work. I don't think she needs to work any hard or anything like that. I think she. <laughs> everyone treats her uh, as anyone. As an equal. That, yeah, as an equal, basically. Yeah. And there's uh, there's all, all, also the other like female employees there as well. But I think as like I Callum like from outside looking in I, I think everyone gets treated properly as well yeah and dad musters like are really like serious about that as well that they don't take any 
did not take any like um harassment or anything like serious like yeah half heartedly as well so yeah it's one of it's one of those things where like um yeah i think there's more the more female i think female um women apply for the job and so i think we try to look for more like women like employees and stuff as well sure yeah. Um, I've got some questions. I'm moving on to like finding work and um, there are lots of great questions coming in on that subject. Um, so I'm going to combine some questions here. So you may recognize some of your questions. Thank you for them. Any Nottingham networking tips? Are there any groups for games staff you recommend? Um, are there any websites that you recommend for looking for work in the industry? All right, so I think as a Kuwait student looking in get into game industry, or just anyone, right? Um, I think definitely having LinkedIn is important, right? Just because like there are there are networking events out there, but just having LinkedIn ha ha gives you accessibility from doing your own like from your own home as well. So you'd have to like really go out and find places. Um, in terms of websites, um, I use a website called Games Job Direct. I, Games Job Direct. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I use that a lot. Like I, that's how I find some of the jobs and stuff like that, and some. And some other advice I give, even if it's just studios that you want to work with, you can just go on their company website as well. Yeah, and they yeah, I generally do most of the, I mean, uh, earlier you referenced, it wasn't, uh, I couldn't remember whether it was Callum or yourself. You were, uh, you, yeah, I think it was you actually, you weren't aware how many Nottingham game studios Yeah, exactly. Were. So can you list them? Are you able to list them now? Right. Because they'll all have websites with job pages, won't they? So obviously there's Dumbusters and there's <laughs> Sumo Digital. Uh, I think there was Fuzzy Frog or Hugo Games, but I don't know if they're under like, I don't know if they're still a thing now. Yeah. And there's Lockwood, I think, yes. as well. Yeah. There's Lockwood as well. And there's another one really on top of my head, though. Uh, I'm testing think... you. <laughs> <laughs> on the spot. Um, I think I can only name four. But yeah, I think there was another one as well. I forgot. I don't know if Callum does know any. I Yeah, in, in terms of Nottingham at large, like, um, maybe it's cheating, but like a uh, Clan Imperium. Uh, has a studio in Derby. Uh, right. It's, it's pretty close. Uh, there's also, <laughs> it's not Bullcare, is it? There's also another studio. I think it's Bullcare, maybe, is in Dar Derby, I think. Um, so, yeah, even even maybe not necessarily Nottingham, the city itself, but like in an easily commutable area. Yeah. Um, it's been a while, like, it's been a while since I've drove there, but as well, I think Rockstar Lincoln isn't isn't that far yeah, away. Rockstar, right? Yeah, 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 it is. So, yeah, e even necessarily not Nottingham itself, but there's, there's quite a few studios around the sort of Midlands area. There's um, another one called Lava Games, which is um, I, I'm aware of from from business work and what the, the stuff that I do on a daily basis. So, and they're based in um, a new enterprise centre in Nottingham Trent University called the Dryden Enterprise Centre. So that's another one, but they all have websites um, which will all have jobs pages. So, um, in addition to the um, job site that um, Akib suggested, are there any other job sites specific? Um, job sites other than LinkedIn and I would encourage every student to have a LinkedIn profile and start that LinkedIn profile now whilst you're at university um, or your college studying because you can use it as a link to your own website to showcase your work your portfolio of work and put your latest work on there that is it's a universal tool I'd say for recruitment LinkedIn without a doubt I think on top, on oh, I'm top of my head, I can't really think of any other websites because I really, I, I just, I highly recommend using Game Job Direct. Uh, yep. Obviously, having LinkedIn and applying for company pages is probably the, the advice I can give in terms of looking for jobs and stuff. I think also, if you have a LinkedIn profile, you'll realize that every other company, whatever the sector, certainly games companies, Sumo Digital's got a LinkedIn profile. So companies have yeah. LinkedIn profiles as well, where For they sure. will advertise. And so um, students or those that are about to graduate can follow those companies via their LinkedIn profile, and they'll automatically receive jobs updates on their timeline. So it's, it's, it's not like lazy job searching, but it really helps because you can obviously get notifications for jobs that are of interest to you. So that's um, always worth considering as well. Yeah, for um, sure. So Nottingham networking tips, have we got any networking tips? Um, I'm not too sure, but I don't know if Callum can answer that question. Um, um, not, not it, I can't say anything like go to this place and speak to this person <laughs> yeah, specifically, but like at least in my experience, uh, sort of like I mentioned before, uh, you'll be really, really surprised how small the world is, uh, yeah. you, you know, at least the industry, right? Uh, in that, like, you always end up knowing someone who knows someone, yeah. and even if it's not someone directly, just as long as 
not everyone's like a social being, right? But like, if you are interested in this space and you make friends and they have friends, it's it's a pretty organic process that you'll end up sort of getting in contact with people who sort of work in the local industry, or even if it's not local, it might be, you know, Leamington Spa, it might be Lincoln, yeah. like I mentioned, Derby, yeah. like this, this sort of local-ish sphere. There are knots, aren't there? There are yeah. knots of companies um, mm -hmm. and they will have networking events and things. There's um, Women's Games I, as well is one to just coming back to the female thing. Mm -hmm. There is a matter. Yeah. Was, was um, that Women in Games, was that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, obviously is not something I get involved with, but yeah, no. <laughs> it is, it, and I've heard obviously through Maggie and everything that it's supposed to be really beneficial. I think it's supposed to be quite good. Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I would um, advocate that for any um, women uh, in games uh, and women on games courses, crucially as well. And we are an ambassador to that at Confetti. So um, get involved, ladies, get involved. Um, I want, I've got a specific question tied in with job searching for Akib. Have you got any advice for anyone wanting to specifically work at Dan Busters, Akib? I haven't got a specific advice, but I can get advice to like applying for QA gestures in general as well. So I think depending on like depending on the companies, so even even if like they're applying for QA testers and they're asking for experience, just apply for it. You never know. I think in my in my, in my case, like when I was applying, um, some managers are looking for like fresh blood, like fresh like fresh like freshly new to the industry and stuff like that. So I think definitely like depending on what if it's, if it's dampers for example like even if they apply for, um advertising like create test roles just apply for it um even if they ask for experience you never know you never know the chances as well that's the thing with like job up um job um applications as well you never know what's gonna happen I feel like the worst you can do is not apply and never yeah. know what would happen but Absolutely. yeah for sure. yeah um sorry I didn't want to cut across you. no no it's anything okay. else you want to say? <laughs> but yes, all right. oh, goodness. okay. Um, is there a programming language that you recommend learning before applying for jobs, or is there time on the job to learn new languages and skills? And this just ties in with the question I was going to ask, which is around getting training, training on the job. So the, qu the first part of this question was: Is there any programming language you need you would recommend before applying for jobs, or is there time to learn on the job? Yeah. So. Um... Um, as a QA tester, we, we obviously we, we have access to a bug data software um, database, right? So every, I think different companies use different things, right? So I think, I don't think they say it's good to know about it, I guess. But I feel like once you feel, if you're quite new to the, um, quite new to the software as well, they, they take the time and actually train you as well. Mm -hmm. So they don't expect you to like know everything. I think it's quite experience, it's quite, it's quite good to know how that works before. But even if you don't know, that's fine. Because I, um, obviously me being the first, um, my first job in the industry, I didn't know about any like all these softwares and stuff like that, but they're more than happy to train everyone as well. Cool, that's really good, isn't it? Um, Callum, yeah, I, I, the I, same I, question to you. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely 100% agree. Just sort of expanding on sort of what I've mentioned before as well. Like, um, and again, just sort of circling back to it one more time is like, there's no nothing wrong with not knowing anything. If anything, they don't expect you to know everything going into it. Uh, not just programming languages, but also like, uh, I bet me and me and Akib didn't know what Jira was before we went. We didn't know how to use version control. Um, at least I don't, I didn't know. I didn't, maybe Akib did. But like, you know, there's, there's loads of pieces of like specific bespoke software uh, that they're not expecting you to know. And if anything, uh, Jira and version control are the two sort of universal ones. Otherwise, a lot of different studios have their own bespoke software that even if you wanted to know how to use it, you can't know how to use it until you get there, right? Like our studio, we have an in-house programming language. Yeah. Um, there's just no way of me knowing that before I got there. So they just taught me how to use it. Yeah. I'd say it depends 100%, like just circling back to the proper, proper question, like what programming language should you know? Depends what you want to be. Um, I think if you're at Confetti doing this, uh, if you want to be sort of, you probably, and you're asking those sort of questions, you probably want to be more of like a technical designer. Mm -hmm. I'd consider myself like a technical designer. It's like a halfway position between being like a, a designer and a programmer. Um, for that, what's been most helpful and the student, I don't know what the students are learning at the moment at Confetti. For me, at least it was Unreal Engine. Yeah. Um, I was learning blueprinting, which is essentially a visual version of C++. Uh, that's really, really mature now, uh, at least in my experience in the games industry at large. Most studios either use Unreal Engine with visual scripting yep. or they use a different engine with their own bespoke type of visual scripting. That's what it is at, at Cloud Imperium. We have an in-house uh, version of blueprints. Uh, but if you want to know a proper language, 
I'd say C sharp is the best. It's just really, really straightforward. It really makes sense. But I suppose the most important aspect is as long as you, once you know one, it's really, really simple. Well, not really simple, but like it's a lot easier to learn a second one because you sit like, if you know C sharp, you can look at blueprints and go, oh, a for loop, that's kind of like a for something, something like they're, they're just named slightly differently or it just looks slightly differently. Yeah. Or like, you know, our in house studio, it's like, oh, a delay, that's like a wait. Like they're the same thing, just named slightly differently. Um, but again, um, even if you guys, I think Akeem touched on the, uh, keep touched on this a little bit, but um, even if you're not planning on being a programmer or even a technical designer, even if you plan on being a QA or an artist or whatever, the more skills you know, especially like I was mentioning with confetti and like touching on all the subjects, yeah, it really really helps when you're speaking with the other departments. Uh, you know, when you're speaking to a programmer and you can be like, look, I don't fully get this, but I sort of get what's going on here, and you have that like yeah. foundation knowledge to be able to like. Yeah converse with them properly that's so Super interesting helpful. that's so interesting that, this absolutely came up in the media panel it's like you know i i studied no this is I, I didn't study sound at confetti obviously i didn't study at confetti but um one of our panelists said oh i i really didn't um enjoy or get on with or fully understand the sound module but but i did it and i'm so glad i did because it's really helped me converse with people about that and appreciate the role they play now that I'm out in the industry and working. So there's like a commonality of language, I think is what we're saying. There's a, a real sense of, you know, the more you know, even if it's not in detail, if it's not deep, deep, deep technical knowledge and skills, it's still gonna help you appreciate your coworkers' roles. 100%, 100%. like I think um, on a day to day to day, it might be the most helpful for a key. Sorry, just give, give me two seconds to keep it like, yeah, it might be really helpful because like for you guys, because you're speaking to the most disciplines all at the same time. But even for me, um, it doesn't matter what role you're in. You're always speaking to lots and lots of different people. You're speaking to artists, programmers, animators, everyone. And they all, it's really important, not really important. Like you don't have to, but knowing just a little bit about what they're doing just yeah. really, really helps you get on with them. Yeah. Right. Sorry, Akeem, you, you next. No, <laughs> for sure. That's no, fine. Was there anything you wanted to say? Oh, no, no, I, I, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I've got a couple more questions that have come in. They're still excellent questions. How helpful have you found companies to be with regard to specialist requirements? I guess this is in office, i.e. if you were sensitive to sound, that might occur in the office. Do they make allowances? I think this is around a working environment and reasonable adjustments. Yeah, what are your uh, experiences of that, that? I think when I started, there was like quite a few documents saying that it does is everything at your desk like appropriate for you? Is the screen too bright or is the seat like things? So yeah. then they do they, they they take a lot of things into consideration. And let's say for example, I think I have had I had like a monitor issue. Um, I think for some reason the brightness wasn't going down. Like for some, I think the brightness wasn't going down. So they're willing to like replace the monitors as well. Yeah. So so they've got a lot of stuff in place for like even if you have like small like requirements or so they really have a uh, documents everything supporting you as well. They are quite serious about all about making Absolutely. sure like your workplace is suitable for you and it's not like harming you in any way. And I think that would be part of the onboarding process. Wouldn't yeah. It? Any company these days there have to be made you know reasonable adjustments made. Yeah to ensure that a, a new employee is comfortable in their working environment. Is that fair to say? Yeah, 100%. Um, what about you, Callum? Have you come across, um, the, you know, yeah. adjustments being made? Yeah, like um, at least on the in, in an individual sort of like a you know common basis, um, everybody has to do like, a, I can't remember what it's called, but the exact same sort of thing where it's like, do your hands touch the desk? Can you, are you seeing the monitor at the right level? Is it comfortable in your seat and all that? Like everybody has to do that. And if you don't, even if you don't have any like uh, specialist requirements or anything like that, like everyone has to get accounted for. Yeah. But if you're like, if you're too tall or not, you know, you're not too tall, but you're like, you know, you're a really tall guy, you know, they'll get you a sit stand desk, right? Yeah. Or they'll get you a special chair. Yeah. Um, if you're in a wheelchair, they'll make sure you're on the ground floor. If it's a multi-story building. Um, like um, I'm struggling to think of any other like examples off the top of my head, but like if you have a specialist requirement, um, you will be accountable. Like even uh, just circling back to COVID for a second, I've got a, uh, it's an amazing uh, systems designer I know and uh, his partner has, um, it's not my business. I don't know what she's, she's uh, she has, but like uh, she's really immune compromised and yeah. uh, he's working fully remote now, uh, just yeah. 100%. He never has to come back again because 
uh, you know, if, if your talent and they, they really, you know, it's important to yeah. keep people. And um, if you have requirements, unless it's something insane, like, uh, I don't know, I require a personal masseuse or something like that. Like <laughs> mo most companies will, no, all companies will accommodate for you. I don't think if you've got a, a disability or anything, anything that you're worried might put a company off you, at, at least in my experience, I can't think of a situation sure. where they would like discount you because of that. Um, it's this question um, kind of segues into the previous question. Do you think there are any issues with accessibility um, or discrimination in the industry for trans people? Uh, no. I, well, I, no, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's too much of a blunt answer. But at least in my experience, I've mm. I met a handful of trans people. Um, again, same, same with uh, speaking about women in games. I couldn't yeah. I couldn't. I can't say what happens behind closed doors. I really don't have enough, you know, I, yeah. I really can't speak for that. But at least in my experience, it's really, really inclusive. Everyone's really accommodating and just really, 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 really friendly people. Sure. Uh, just, just really good. Uh, I couldn't, again, maybe to awful things happen behind closed doors, but I, at least in my experience, my limited sort of view, um, people will treat, people treat everyone with respect. I think it doesn't matter sure. who you are. Uh, assholes don't like a, a big part of the games industry is uh, communication and sort of yeah. talking to each other and sort of having to work as a part of the team yeah and if you can't work with people like if you're a bigot you're not going to last very long absolutely i keep have you got anything to add to that answer no it's pretty much like column like there's only so much of we can see but i think as far as yeah. as far as we can uh, as far as i can see is right i think everyone gets treated with respect no matter what like if you're trans or not like that's what it is basically Absolutely. I mean, my my understanding of um, the games industry is very similar. It's very inclusive. It's incredibly friendly and yeah. people will just make room for people, um, whatever, whatever. Um, so um, that's a, a good question and good answers. Thank you. I think well, I wanted to, wanted to say as well, yeah. um, I think part of working in the game industry is big. Um, I think the two biggest thing is respect and communication as well. Sure. I think yeah. if you don't have that, then I don't think you can't like you don't that you won't last well. You won't last long in the game industry. Sure. Um. Again, this this next question has just come in. Um. Is ties in. Um. Should you be upfront about mental health issues before you start working at a company? Yeah, I think so. Um. Yeah. I think it, it it shows it gives HR like a heads up, and then they yeah. can accommodate you. I think with the um, our Dumbusters, we have a um well being well being team as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I think. I think they are they are quite serious about mental health. I think you should be quite upfront about it with HR. Yes. So yeah. just so they they know about it and they can accommodate anyhow they can as well. So I think you definitely should be upfront about it. Yeah, I think um we have a wellbeing team here at Confetti yeah. as well, and um I think the more that we talk about the uh, mental health issues, um it um stops a stigma of not being able to talk about it. Callum, yeah. what, Callum, what's your experience? Do you think you should be upfront with mental yeah. health issues? I'd 100% agree. Uh, I'd say that, I'd say that when those issues come up, 100% you should be honest. But I'd also say that you don't don't feel any kind of pressure to sort of forewarn anything, uh, anyone about issues. And you, like if you're sitting down for your first interview, you don't you don't have to warn anyone. If you want to keep that privately, or you you don't want to share, like you don't think it's their business, you don't have to. And when those issues do come up, they will be accommodating. At least in my experience, like. Yeah. Um, I think there's already, there's quite a decent amount of understanding, like not always perfect, but pretty good understanding in the games industry, in my experience. Uh, but so, so what I'm saying is that like, if things do just come up out of the blue, you're not, you haven't led anyone and you haven't tricked mm -hmm. anyone into sort of hiring you and you've got something going on or, or anything like you can be honest when, when things flare up and they will be accommodating to you. But yeah, if I think it's just really good. It doesn't matter what it is. I think you should always feel comfortable to be honest and say like, hey, this is me and um, it's part of the package, I guess. Absolutely, absolutely, 100%. Um, I've got another question here. It's very specific to Callum, but I'm just gonna wanna come skip back one. Um, post pandemic, is it possible to work for a company completely remotely and not have to move home is a question. What 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 would your responses be to that? Um uh -huh. Oh, sorry. Go, 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 go. <laughs> um, I think it's highly dependent on like the studio itself, depending like how they like handle the whole pandemic and working from home. I know some companies, 
they, they develop a hybrid model maybe, or they might be thinking about developing a hybrid model. I think it's usually the preferences on the different, depending on what studio thing. I think with Dumbusters, we did work from home for a while, like, I mean, but as obviously as things are easing up, the option to come back to the office, is, it's, it's there now. But I think they are working on a hybrid model as well. So who so knows? So it's not necessarily going to be enforced that you have to return to the office. Yeah, yeah, for, for those sure. that are more comfortable working remotely for whatever reason. Yeah, for sure. Um, good questions, good questions. Probably got time for a couple more. Um, there's a student who wants to work at Cloud Imperium as a 3D vehicle or weapon designer. Does Callum have any insights or advice for them achieving this goal, Callum? Uh, like... Pardon me. I'm, I'm like a technical designer, so I don't know about the specifics of 3D modeling stuff. Obviously, I'm more than happy. Like, um, I'm Callum Hancock. If you message me on LinkedIn, like, I'm more than happy to speak to you more about it. Like, on a probably a one-to-one -one basis would probably be the best for something like that. But sitting here right now, um, yeah, I don't know. Obviously, I'm not a 3D modeler, so I can't, I can't sure? say anything off the off the bat about it. Well, maybe offline. Um, that, that there's, that, you know, um, that student could, um create a LinkedIn profile if they haven't done so already, contact you and um, mention that you're a confetti student and you attended this session. And Callum, maybe you could, if you wouldn't mind, that would be amazing. Yeah, I mean, um, I mean that, that goes for any student. Like, obviously, absolutely. I, I don't know how much time we've got left, but like... Um, a couple of minutes. Yeah, when it comes down to it and you still have questions or like, you know, we haven't answered it in full or whatever's going on and you want a bit more, like, obviously, I'm, I'm a busy person. I, I do, I might take me a bit to get back to your messages. Like, I've already got at least two students that have messaged me since the start of industry week, and I have just not had time to message them back. But um, what was I saying? Yeah, it, just just shoot us a message. And I assume both me and Akib, like, yeah, for sure, we yeah, can get back sure. to you. Um, my LinkedIn is always there as well. So even if you need some insight, like QA and stuff, feel free to give me a um, follow. I'll get back. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. I'm sure a lot of our students will be um, getting in touch with you over the next few days. But please, students, be aware that they are working as well. <laughs> so they may take a while to get back to you. Um, this is a good one. I'm gonna, this is going to be the last question now, I think, um, before I've got a final question for you. Do you socialise with work colleagues outside of work much? Does working in the industry make you not want to play games at home as much because it's your job? <laughs> <laughs> I get told this a lot. Even my mom says, like, you, you work on a game for the whole day and you come back and you play more games. Like, don't you get burnt out or anything like that? I was, I, you know what? I think I've got a way of, like, I can, like, I, I can go, I can play games at work because I'm looking for, like, I'm looking for bugs and yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Whereas I'm at home, I'm just enjoying the game. And I think that's a two <laughs> yeah. different things as well. Not, not to say I don't enjoy the game I'm playing, but I think I enjoy it more. I can go more of an on autopilot and just, I can just enjoy the game for what it sure. is. Yeah, for sure. Do you do you socialize with colleagues? I do sometimes, I but it, it I won't, I'll say something though. But it's quite hard because um I'm a Muslim, so I don't drink and and obviously the, um my colleagues tend to go to the pubs and stuff like that. But I do sometimes join up with them. It, it, but there's always say like a line that I can't like I, won't, I can't fully socialize with them just because I can't yeah. like I share a drink with them. But but then again, like I still go to the pubs with them now and then and just like have a little chit chat and stuff. So it, it I do socialize, but not as much as I could have as well yeah 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 i understand i appreciate that I, I what about you quite, callum I, I think that was quite a good point actually about drinking at the pub i do think that's a bit of a problem in the games industry i, I personally quite like drinking a lot but um <laughs> uh a lot of people like a lot of networking and things like that which we're speaking about before is quite sort of like on a personal sort of social level mm -hmm. and a lot of that ends up happening at the pub right yeah. like you know you're going out to bars drinking and all just mad ones like that right yeah, yeah but like if you're not into that you are missing out a tiny bit like obviously i'm not telling you you are Akiva, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, I, think, yeah. I think it's there's a i wouldn't say like an alcoholism problem but like there's a lot of drinks involved with games and um yeah I, I haven't got an answer for that i just think it's um it's an interesting observation that so much of it goes on there yeah it is an interesting observation because i think that's it's a, like an intrinsic part of our culture <laughs> it really is um but it can be a bit of a barrier can't it to mm -hmm. yeah to def definitely like a they seem definitely, to join in the, the, there have been times when i just buy like alcohol free beers because i'm just not in the mood but yeah. i just want to hang yeah. out and just sort of like i don't want to feel like i'm not a part of it if you know sure. what i mean so uh, but yeah, like it, just circling back to like, does it make me want not want to play games and stuff? Uh, I work from the same desk that I sort of like is my personal PC desk as well. Uh -huh. uh, there is a little bit of it there. I do think um, if you sort of like live in environments a little bit too small, uh, it can sort of uh, 
not, not screw with me, but like sort of like um, if I finish up work for the day and it's like I take my hands off the keyboard and it's like I finish working and then I put them back down and then carry on playing games, it's a little bit like, oh Jesus Christ, like I, I, I'm not sick of this desk. I want I want to I want to see something else than these like walls and stuff. Yeah. Like so I'm I'm looking forward to like my, my Steam Deck turning up. I enjoy going on my Switch and stuff. Like I enjoy being in front of the TV yeah. instead of my desk for playing yeah, yeah, games. Yeah. But like yeah. if that's more some of you guys, like you might like I'm I'm a big PC guy. But like since I've started working, I've transitioned to using my PC at the TV, like console sort of fashion. Uh-huh. And um, you might notice changes like that, but like, um, yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't kill kill it for me. It's just sitting at the desk, which is yeah. irritating. Uh, socializing, I think that's good as well. Like I speak to plenty of the people I work with outside of work. You just got to make sure it's not all about work. That's yeah, why absolutely. People don't want to speak about work outside of work sometimes. No. Um, I'm going to have to round things up now. So I'm just going to ask you one final question to both of you. Um, if you could rewind yourself to your student self, what piece of advice would you give our students today? One single piece of advice. Heavy one. Um, that is a good one. <laughs> Akib, do you want to go first while Callum has a little think? <laughs> no, I do you think about results. Oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> How can you condense it into one piece of advice? I, I'd, I'd say something like it does get... It gets harder in some ways. It gets easier in others. As you get old, like it's not one piece of advice, but as you get older, you get, if you struggle with stress, I struggle with stress. I struggle with my anxiety and stuff. Uh, as you get older, you find it easier to cope with those things. Yep. It's something that comes over time, I think. Uh, and it does get easier, like as in life. I mean, uh, even if you find it a little bit overwhelming, uh, but just sort of stick at it. It gets better once you set, like after, like I assume, Akiva, even like in your experience, once you sort of, once the job's there, once a few paychecks have came through and you can just sit down and be like, okay, yeah, I've made it now. It's, I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. Like that, that's a good feeling. And yeah. um, even if it feels like it's really far off, uh, you'll be there eventually. And I don't know, it's worth it when you get there, I think. Worth it when you get there. Uh, okay, yeah. but to you, what's, what's, what's your would, piece of advice? I would say that, you know, once you like graduate or like you ever think about, oh, is the game industry really for me, anything like that? I think you just take a step back and think about why you roll at Confetti. I do enjoy the games. Just evaluate your things. I think that's, I think when I was at, uh, at Confetti, um, I was surrounded by really talented people. Like they were cra- coming up with some crazy like level design, 3D models. It really put me, it really put me to shame. I was like, how, how, how come I can't do that? But then again, it's one of those times where like I took a step back and realized why did I enroll Confetti in the first place? Yeah. It's because of my passion, my gaming and stuff like that. And I just like persevered through it. So even if you like at that t- at that point in Confetti where you're thinking like, oh, I'm not doing really good or anything, just take a step back and just think about everything. And maybe just with me personally, I I realized I was struggling a lot of different like sectors of the gaming course. But I just I just did it outside my um a college uh, university hours. Yeah. But then also another thing was like, I kind of re- reminded myself about my gaming passion and I really want to work in the industry no matter what. And I guess there's another thing I could say is keep an open minded about it stuff. Yeah. Because um, I was willing to, I think if Dumbusters didn't get back, I was willing to apply for like Code Master, which is a car game, a uh, car studio. And yeah. I'm not into car games whatsoever. Like I don't like, I don't like playing them. But because I really wanted to work in the industry, I was willing to like jump into that sort of games and like get that experience. And then hopefully, I get to go into more of a studio that I uh, the genre of game I like playing. So take a step back and remember there are other opportunities. Yeah. And remember why you got into it in the first place. Yeah. yeah. I'm probably just keeping open minded as well. Yeah. Very good advice. Um, I'm so sorry. We're going to have to fit round things up now. So if you guys wouldn't mind staying online for a couple of minutes more, um, that would be great. But to the rest of you, thank you so much for coming today. I hope you've enjoyed this morning's games panel. Good luck with all your studies and with your um, job searches. And thank you for attending. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you.